every single piece of recorded music since the dawn of time is available somewhere on YouTube or Spotify or something. So you're not competing with the band down the street anymore. You're competing with Prince and Buddy Holly and Elvis Presley. Hey everybody, we are back. This is Words of Fang interviews at the Between the Waves music conference, btwmadison.com. Check it out, it's in June, it's in Madison, Wisconsin. You missed it this year, that's okay. Come next year, uh, it is in June. And of course, if you wanna see all of the interviews that we've done completely uncut, unfiltered, knowledge comes straight to your noggin, drop us a buck at Patreon, patreon.com slash Lords of the Trident. We're gonna be having all of the interviews uh, posted on our Patreon Uncut. The stuff that you're seeing here public is, uh, you know, is cut down. You're taking the, the best tidbits and we're saving them for the Patreon. So Between the Waves have a, has a bunch of amazing, fantastic speakers. And we have a doozy today. We have a wonderful, fantastic speaker, a titan of the industry, Mr. Craig Anderton. Hi, oh Ty. my gosh, I'm so excited to sit down with you. Hi, Ty. <laughs> <laughs> And, B and let me add, yeah, BTW is great. You know, mm -hmm. I have a perfect attendance record here. I'll be here next year. Excellent, excellent. So for the people who are not familiar with Craig Anderton, can you give us a little bit of background on you, you know, all, all of your accomplishments and such? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I do a lot of different things. I mean, I was a session musician in the 70s. I toured in the 60s. I played Carnegie Hall. I've invented things. Um, Steinberg and Motu virtualized one of my one of my uh, hardware modules. I've written over 36 books, over a thousand articles, uh, uh, mastered hundreds of tracks. I don't know how many. I've mastered <laughs> hundreds of tracks. I've I've played on produced uh, 20 no more than 20 albums, um, and those and those projects range from uh, classical classical harpsichord all the way to like hardcore German electronic stuff. I played in Germany for quite a while with uh, Reisdorf Force, oh. German experimental group, and also guested with Air Liquide. Um, so I've, and I also, I've, I work a lot with Brian Hardgroove from Public Enemy. We do production stuff. And we had a band together at one point called EV2, which mm. was him playing drums and me playing guitar. And it was a, a hex guitar, so I was articulating all the parts on the guitar because I was trained classically, so I could do fingerstyle stuff. So that's, the, that's sort of the tip of the iceberg. I mean, I co-founded Electronic Musician Magazine, uh, edited EQ. I've been doing Harmony Central, uh, do a lot of consulting to mm -hmm. companies and manuals and things like that. So That's amazing. That's, I mean... A lot of different stuff. That's incredible. You know, I want to hear that harpsichord album now or the, <laughs> the harpsichord track. Okay, I yeah. gotta tell you something about the harpsichord. Yeah. And, and this is relevant to, you know, to people wanting to get out of the garage or whatever. Yeah. Um, so there's a typical way to record classical harpsichord. Classical harpsichord is a soft instrument. It sort mm -hmm. of tinkles in the background, you know. And so the traditional thing is you set up an XY mic and you aim it at the harpsichord and it sounds, you know, like every other harpsichord recording you've ever heard. Mm -hmm. Well, the lady I was working with is named Kathleen McIntosh, and she's an, not only an incredible harpsichord player, but to her, classical music is not a museum piece. Mm. With her, it's like Bach came over that day and said, Kathy, I got this great song you got to check out, you know, <laughs> and she plays it like, like it just was invented yesterday. Mm -hmm. And you hear, you know, you hear all that beautiful harmonic work and stuff like that. And, you, and it, it just really... It takes classical music out of the classroom type of thinking, yeah. the academic world, and it turns into like a vital musical form like it was at the time. Mm. You know what I mean? And so I said, you know, Kathleen, I've, I've always wanted to close mic a harpsichord. So the guy who was the executive producer on the project was like, well, I don't know about that, you know? And, yeah, yeah. And so I said, well, look, let's try an experiment. So I did a, the traditional miking. And then I did the way that I wanted to mic it, which was like rock and roll piano, you know, t two mics on the soundboard, mm -hmm. close mic. And um, I played, I brought Kathleen and I didn't tell her which was which. I played them both. I said, which, which one do you prefer? Mm. And without a millisecond of hesitation, that one, that one, that's what a harpsichord sounds like. That's what it sounds like when I'm playing a harpsichord. Mm -hmm. And you know, it almost sounds electronic. It almost sounds like some crazy DX7 patch or something because it picks up the mechanics. Mm. The only problem was that it picked up all the hammer noises and stuff. So there was a lot of editing involved uh -huh. and I didn't get rid of them. I just brought them down a little bit in volume. But the harpsichord just sounded fantastic. And a lot of that is that thinking outside of the box type mm -hmm. of thing. And it became, it, it sold a lot of copy. I mean, it was a very good class. It got great reviews. I mean, no one ever said, 
I think the people reviewing it weren't aware of rock and roll miking techniques. So yeah. they did say, oh, yeah, he might do like a rock and roll piano. They just said, <laughs> harpsichord sounds great, <laughs> you know? There you go. Yeah. So it, it's the, the moral of that story is you got to carve out a unique sound no matter mm. what you're doing. You have to do something that's different. Because other, if I hadn't done that, it would be one of, you know, 4,000 harpsichord Bach albums that would be just like the other ones except played better. Right, right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> So I think it's, it's, it's probably an understatement to say that, you know, since you began in the music industry till today, you know, there's been a little bit of change, right? A little bit of, <laughs> a little bit of change, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, a little um, bit. I'm, I'm wondering your perspective, you know, especially from the technology and from the mixing side of things, um, what are some salient points that jump out at you where you think it, it's much better today than it was 30, 40 years ago or, or whatever, you know. And, and what are some salient points where you're saying, well, it, you know, maybe it was a little bit better back in the day. Is there, is there anything that, that kind of jumps out? Oh, yeah, out? yeah. Um, technologically speaking, everything's better today. Yeah. I have no romance with tubes. I have no romance with tape. I really don't. And a lot of the reasons why people like things is for the wrong reasons. Hmm. Like, like they'll say, oh, amp sims, they sound terrible. I like, I like my, my tube amp. No, they don't like the tube amps. They like the cabinet that's being the low-pass filter above mm. for 5K hertz on down. So all the crap that the tube produces, which is considerable, you never even hear. Whereas the amp sim, which is emulating the tube, reproduces that crap perfectly. And so you have to tame it inside the computer the way that a real cabinet tamed the sound back in the day. Mm -hmm. People talk about, oh, tape, you know, it has it had this sort of magical sound. A lot of times it wasn't the tape, it was the input transformers on the consoles that really mm. made the difference. And um, there was one time I was visiting Wendy Carlos, you know, switched on Bach, and she had one of these ancient, uh, it was one of the first digital tape recorders. It was done by Akai. It was pre-ADAT. Mm -hmm. And I'd heard them, and they sounded not that great. Hers sounded great. It sounded great. I'm like... So, Wendy, what's the deal? Oh, I put transformers at the input of the mixer. Ah. Transformers are a unique signal processor. They add sort of a distortion to the low end. They're fantastic for bass. A lot of the console emulator software you get these days, if it doesn't emulate the input transformer, it's not going to give you the sound you want. Hmm. You know, so there's a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of the mystique about this stuff. Or like someone who like goes out and wants to find a, a, a Neumann microphone from 1952 or something like that, some vintage <laughs> microphone. And so they find one and they pay $40,000 or whatever because they would never buy just a copy of a Neumann, you know? And then they find out that the uh, diaphragm started to deteriorate after about 20 years and that the copy's way better, hmm. you know? So there's a lot of mythology around this stuff. Uh, I would never want to go back to tape. I can get the sound of tape with with digital i can get guitar sounds with amp sims that are better than traditional amplifiers mm -hmm. i don't want to use traditional amp they don't sound as good you can't process them in multiple bands and things like that yeah so um yeah i would i would not I, I i really can't think of anything uh of the of the back in the day that was better than what we have now i mean people talk about oh pull tech equalizers i loved the sound of pull tech equalizers i was there when they were like hardware units that were actually new products, you yeah, know? Yeah, and yeah. they sounded great. But so did the emulations of them. It's just backing off on the curve. It's like, uh, I was talking to someone who has uh, Studio One, and he's like, oh, I really need to get a, uh, I really want to get a Pultec, you know, EQ to complement the one that's bundled with the program. And I'm like, you can get that sound with the one that's bundled in the program. Just turn the cue down and turn mm. down the amount of boost, and you'll get the same thing. And he was like, oh, no. It's a, but the Pultec, it had, I said, no. No, it doesn't. And so I created a curve that was exactly the same. Now, the uh, Pultec used inductors, which is subtly different. So you stick your input transformer emulator in front of the EQ and, and you're good to go. Now, what we have lost, um, which, is, which is a real shame, is the interaction aspect. Like, um, we had sessions booked before the Hendrix Electric Ladyland sessions. Mm -hmm. So we'd come into the session and Hendrix would be mixing and the guys from Traffic would be sitting there and we'd be talking about stuff, you know, and I would watch Hendrix mix and, you know, use his flanging setup on our album and that kind of stuff. And you, don't, you can't do that anymore, mm -hmm. you know, in this, as easily. That was the way it was. Yeah. The other thing is that it was possible to make a living as a musician in a local market. Boston had a music scene, Detroit had a music scene, Philadelphia had a music scene. We were a house band in Philadelphia, and we, you know, we were playing six nights 
a week, every week somewhere, mm -hmm. either as a house band or a gig we got in Boston or a gig we got in the Midwest somewhere or whatever, and could make a really nice living doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's very difficult to do these days. So what, what, what advice would you give somebody who says, okay, I want to do music full time, you know, since, since that has changed? You know, what, what's, what's your first response to somebody who says, I want to do music full time? Good luck. No, <laughs> no, seriously. That is a good response. Um, a couple things. Number one is um, I really, one thing that's maybe not as much known about me is I, is I do a lot of futuristic, of uh, futurism. So like before Napster even existed, I wrote a piece about how in the future all music was going to be downloaded digitally into the home and physical objects would cease to exist. Mm -hmm. And that was considered kind of radical at the time. You know, and in 1981, I... Basically, I gave a paper at the AES that said about EDM, that EDM was going to become the dominant musical form at some point. So I'm, I'm always trying to look into the future, and that's a prelude to the answer. Mm -hmm. What's really changed is that you got to remember that music has only been able to be frozen in time and preserved for a little over 100 years. Right. Music was always ephemeral live performance. If you missed Beethoven's Fifth, you missed Beethoven's Fifth. You know what I mean? You had, yeah. to, you had to show up there. You had to be at the concert hall. And when people came to you the next day and said, my God, that was an amazing experience. You're like, oh, well, okay, cool. Yep. <laughs> you know, whereas now, every single piece of recorded music since the dawn of time is available somewhere on YouTube or Spotify or something. So you're not competing with the band down the street anymore. You're competing with Prince and Buddy Holly and Elvis Presley. I mean, if you want to, you can dig back. You're, you're competing with, uh, with Artie Shaw on the clarinet, and nobody knows who Artie Shaw is, you know, but if you listen to his clarinet playing, he was like the Eric Clapton of the clarinet, and you can pick up some great solo ideas by listening to him, hmm. you know, or some of the swing bands, the Benny Goodmans of this world, John Coltrane, amazing stuff, Miles Davis. Miles Davis is a complete course on how to make the minimal amount of sound have the most impact, you know. All this stuff is out there. Plus, we've added all these genres. We've added EDM, we've added hip hop, we've added rap. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of people are dismissive of newer types of music. You know, oh, I would never listen to rap. It's like, well, I would never listen to 90% of any genre of music. Mm -hmm. But there's that 10% that's incredible, no matter what kind of music you're listening to. So that's who you're competing with. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, record companies were always like, they were looking for the next Springsteen or the next Michael Jackson. They don't have to do that anymore because you can listen to Springsteen or Michael Jackson 24 hours a day if you want. So the first thing I tell people is, you have to be original. You have to be doing something that nobody else is doing. That's mm -hmm. number one, or you're not even gonna get in the door. Because if, if your music comes on and it sounds like some, some, something else, why bother listening to it? Mm -hmm. But if your music comes on, it's like something they've never heard before. It's like, whoa, what was that? Mm. You know? Um, I mean, if you think back to the first time uh, when Hendrix first appeared. Now, so many people have copied him since then that mm -hmm. it doesn't have the same kind of impact. But back then, no one had done that before. You know, and so within the first 10 seconds of Jimi Hendrix's first album, you knew that either aliens had landed or an entirely new musical form had been invented, you know? <laughs> so that's number one. So number one is you have to come up with something unique. That's the, gate, that's the first gating element. The second gating element is it has to be something that people want to listen to. Mm. And that's not as easy as it sounds, because if you think about it, with a population, what, we have like 400 million in this country, 375, something, something like that. Something like that, yeah, yeah. So if, it used to be if someone bought a million copies of something, that was a big deal. But look at the percentage of the population that that is. That's tiny. Mm -hmm. So all the rest of those, you know, 99.77% or of the people didn't care for it enough to buy it. Mm. So you're, you know, you're, you're targeting a pretty small, music is so subjective, you know, that not everybody's gonna like everything and people are gonna like different things for different reasons and all that. So the other advice I give people is you have to be yourself. You can't be calculating about what people are gonna like because if you're yourself and you do what you really love to do and what comes naturally, that doesn't guarantee success. Mm -hmm. People may hate it, but 
at least you get to do it. And if people, <laughs> at least it, you'll like it. At least you'll like it. Your friends will like it. And if you do something that resonates with people and it does become popular, then you have a career because you have not faked anything. There's no artifice involved. If you're you, you can keep doing you forever and people will respond. One of the people in the listening panel yesterday, 20-year-old mm -hmm. kid, okay, and his song stuck out to me as like, I would listen to that. That's, that's, you know, that was new, that was fresh, it was, it was something different. And I went up to him afterwards and I said, okay, I'm about to give you the best piece of advice you're ever gonna get. He said, what's that? I said, don't listen to any advice. Just, you're on the path, you know what you're doing, just do you, 10 years from now you're gonna be awesome. So just leave it at that, hmm. you know? Um, but the other thing too is that music is now a calling card for other things in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a YouTube channel, and I have like 1,400 subscribers. What's the YouTube channel? Let's, let's... Uh, YouTube.com slash The Craig Anderton. The Craig Anderton. There you go. <laughs> and unfortunately, Craig Anderton was taken, so I had to be pretentious about it. I didn't want to have Craig Anderton <laughs> the... 6729 right, or something, right, right, you know? Right. Anyway, but um, I would do music if nobody listened to it. It's a biological necessity for me. I just, I'm a musician. I do music. Now... I've done some music that's done really, really well. And I've done some music that hasn't done well at all, mm -hmm. but it's always been real and I've always enjoyed doing it. And I've actually, at some points in my life, I've made a lot of money from music. At some points in my life, I haven't made any money from music, mm -hmm. but I keep doing it. And what's interesting about what I'm doing now with music is that it's actually, people listen to the music and they go, oh, I, I like that sound, and then they see that I write books about how to get good mixes and how to do mastering and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So they end up buying the books, even though they're getting music for free on YouTube. Or I did a I did a video of this of the Helix Line Six, the Line Six Helix yeah, did, of yeah. the preset patches, and I put that online, and all the like all these people are buying my my presets, but uh -huh. they're also being exposed to my music. And I've noticed that since I put that online a lot more, there's a lot more of the other stuff getting clicks too. Mm -hmm. So it used to be, see, I don't promote this stuff really. I mean, I'll mention it at a seminar, but you know, I'm, you know, a hundred people in a room or something like that, it's not going to take over the world, right. but you do it one person at a time. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you get your fan base and you know, you, you, you do everything you can to reach as many people as you can in as many ways as you can. Mm -hmm. Like I have a, okay, I have a Twitter account. I would say the most of the people who subscribe to my Twitter account, I don't put music, I mean, I will link to my music on there, mm -hmm. but every month, the first week of every month, I put out a nag that people should back up their data. You know, it's the first week of the month, have you backed up your data? It's the only part of the computer that you can't replace, <laughs> you know? And um, I, I, I just can't fathom musicians who come to me and say, oh, my heart just crashed, I lost everything. <laughs> That's your fault. That's yeah. not the computer's yeah. fault. That's not the hard disk's fault. So people subscribe to my Twitter feed, not to find out what new music I'm doing, but to be reminded to back up their data. And it gets more retweets than anything else. <laughs> but then if they go one or two tweets different, oh, he does music too. You yeah. know, they, they just might click on it. Yeah. So it used to be when I put a new video up on YouTube, you know, a month later it'd have like a hundred clicks or, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and now, now when I put a new thing on, it's got like seven or 800, you know? So it's, it's all, you gotta be patient. Mm -hmm. You gotta be true to yourself. You gotta be different. You gotta enjoy doing it. As someone who is, you know, a, a titan in the technology and recording side of things, this may be a bit of a, a, a loaded question or, or maybe, <laughs> maybe a big question. If somebody came to you and they said, hey, I want to start recording my own music. I don't know where to start. I don't know where to begin. What, what is the bare minimum that I need to start making stuff that sounds halfway decent in my bedroom? That's not enough information. Oh, okay, okay. First of all, they need to buy all my books, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, are they making beats? Are they Mac? Are they Windows? Are they rock? Are they doing audio for video? Are they doing, do they want to do sound design stuff more for film? Mm -hmm. um, are they a singer songwriter? You know, I mean, there's like a zillion questions because it's gonna guide them different ways. Like if they're mostly, well, I, you know. Let's say they're a metal band. If they're a metal band. Okay, well that, that actually simplifies things. Okay. Um, first of all, you need a computer. Mm-hmm. But you don't really need a computer. You can just get a Tascam Model 24. Mm. I mean, it depends. Uh, do, you want, do you want to go down the computer rabbit hole? 
Uh, do you need to do editing? Do you need to use plugins? Do you need to modify your sound? Or are you mostly after a live sound that you've honed over the years? Yeah, yeah, Then yeah. you can just go into the inputs of your Model 24s and call it good, huh. you know? Um, and that's like, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's basically a giant mixer that records. Oh, okay. Um, so it's like, if, you're, if you want to play live with your band, just plug everybody in. And if you need to edit something, you can always bounce a track out and bounce it back in again, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I know, I know there's one guy, there's a guy I work with over in England. I've covered some of his songs. He's a fantastic songwriter. He records everything into this little Korg thing and generates MP3s. Really? But his stuff sounds fantastic huh. because his songs are so good. It could be recorded on anything. <laughs> and the songs are just so good that it, it just doesn't matter. Mm. So, um, so that's one option. If you're going to go, the, if you need to do editing, if you need plugins, if you need to get a more radio ready sound, sure. if you need to do mastering, that's a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. If you're planning on doing albums, collections of songs, that's something. So for example, if you're wanting to do uh, straight ahead recording, you don't want to have to spend a lot of money. So you want, you want something that comes bundled with a lot of plugins, mm -hmm. you know, um, you also want to do your own mastering cause you want to put stuff out either as a digital release on your website as MP3s or flack or whatever, but you maybe want to burn some CDs for the merch table, yeah. you yeah. know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you and you have a you've acquired a taste for EDM that's not with your main band, but you'd like to be able to do some kind of EDM-ish stuff when no one's looking. Sure, sure. You know? So I, if you, if those were your requirements, I'd say get Studio One, okay. because that has a mastering page on it that's really clever, and it's the only program that does it where you can be mastering a collection of songs, and if song number seven comes along and you go, oh, the vocal's too soft, yeah. you can hit a button, go into the song itself, make that change, hit another button, it renders it back to the master. And, interesting, you know? interesting. So, but if you have no interest in, in, and it makes CDs and does digital releases, uh -huh. and it also does DDP exports if you wanna to go to disc makers and get a thousand CDs made for your fan right, base, right, you know? Right. And that, so that's ideal for that, mm -hmm. you know? But on the other hand, if you say, well, I'm doing a lot of collaboration with like three or four different people and we're, you know, like they do the vocals and they do this. Well, the, the probably the most used program out there is Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the most capable by any means, um, but it's, it's good for that. On the other hand, if you came to me and you said, I'm totally into EDM and I really love the live experience. I mm -hmm. love playing live, but I want to be able to put that stuff in the studio as well. I want to be able to work in the studio. Mm -hmm. I would say, Get Ableton Live. Yeah, I was going to say Ableton Live. It's, Everybody I know who does EDM is uses all a Ableton Live. Now, that's not the only option, but that's a really good option. And the other thing is it has an audio engine that just won't quit. I mean, it's, whole, it's all optimized for never screwing up live. Mm -hmm. Now, that makes it less capable in the studio for some things, but it's an extremely capable program in the studio as well. It's just oriented that way. Gotcha. I mean, there's all, it's, so it really depends on what you want to do. Okay. Like one final piece of advice, uh -huh. you're a singer-songwriter, so you want to buy an audio interface. So you say, well, you know, I, I really only need two inputs. I, want, I need a two in, two out. I need one for the mic and one for the guitar. Mm -hmm. Well, do you also play bass? Well, yeah. How many guitars do you have? Well, I have a Les Paul, I have a Strat, and then I have an acoustic guitar. Okay. And what do you use? Do you like, use any kind of rhythmic back? Well, yeah, I have a drum machine and I, I can play a little keyboards. Okay. Now you, need a, now you need a 20 input interface <laughs> so that they're all patched in, all ready to go at the same time. So you're not just moving patch cords around all the time. Right. So you spend an extra $200, you get an interface with all those inputs, and now you've just saved yourself $200 of time a thousand times over. You know? So there's a thing, little sneaky things like that you might not think about. Gotcha. Or there are some interfaces that are actually mixers. Like the PreSonus mixers have USB ports. Mm -hmm. uh, QSC has a really nice mixer with a USB port and stuff like that. So a Tascam. So there you go. You you can take that same mixer, use it as an audio interface, take it out to the gigs, mix your band with it. Hmm. You know, so, so you really have to define, I've often dreamed that it would be great to create the checklist of all times, <laughs> which would be a computer program where you would specify all the things you wanted to do and say, Get this. Yep, yep, yep. Well, uh, 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 I could listen to you talk all day. This is absolutely amazing. I know you've got a, uh, a panel coming up, so I won't keep you very much longer. Let the people know where they can find you. Let them know the links, uh, links to your books, maybe. Um, yeah. Okay. The, 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 main, the main nerve center is CraigAnderton.com. CraigAnderton.com. And I'm not the kind of person who is winning, who wants to win the update wars. You know, it doesn't get updated. At all. It only gets updated when there's something new and interesting. Okay. You know, so like, um, 
you know, you, ch you check back once every few weeks and you'll know if something's happening. Uh, uh, YouTube.com slash the Craig Anderton. Mm -hmm. um, that's the place for the music and the instructional videos. And it's, it's, that's actually worth subscribing to because you never know when something's going to show up. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to have to check back because, I mean, like, I just put up a new song a few weeks ago and I just finished another one now and that's going to go up. So sometimes it'll be like months between songs. Sometimes it'll be a few days. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, it's subscribe to that. Uh, the books are available from howleonard.com. Okay. And a very exciting development in my life uh -huh. is uh, I'm opening up a digital storefront on Reverb.com. I'm sort of like the proof of concept for them. Mm -hmm. And so you'll be able to buy my books in electronic versions. You'll be able to buy the patches for the Elite, for the uh, Line 6 for the Helix. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to buy uh, sample libraries, you know, all these things that, I, I mean, I have a lot of products out there. Uh, the other thing is that I've been writing a series of Studio One specific books that are available on presonus.com, but they'll be available on my website, on, I mean, on my Reverb site now. Yeah. And I wrote another book called the, the, the Huge Book of Cakewalk by Band Lab Tips, which is over 400 pages for that when program. When do you sleep? When do you like? <laughs> well, you know, a lot of this, if you know, if you want, if you want three more minutes, I'll tell you something I also think is kind of important. Go ahead. If if you've got it, I've got it. Yeah. Oh no, I only take five minutes to set up. All right. Um, it's very important to have everything be multi-purpose. Everything has to be multi-purpose. So I got a Line Six Helix because I was reviewing it for uh, for Harmony Central. Mm -hmm. I was doing like an extensive review of it. Plus, I you know Line Six stuff is generally pretty darn good, so I was curious to check it out. And so I started coming up with presets for myself. And I went to line six and I said, I'll trade you the presets for the Helix. Mm. And they said, well, we'll trade you continuing to come up with presets for the Helix, but we want you to be on a marketplace that we're starting. Mm. So it's like, okay, make presets, keep a Helix and make some money. I, nothing wrong with that. Yeah, yeah, so I've yeah. actually, but I've actually contributed a fair amount to them in terms of feedback on future versions and things like that. So it's been, it's been a good relationship. And the presets went up there. And again, people, so people are hearing the music that was done with the presets that's actually putting some money in the bank. I mean, it's not a huge amount, mm -hmm. but lots of little things add up to something substantial. You know, so I try to get as much use out of everything as I possibly can. Like when I, I, I'll review a keyboard, and just as occurred, I mean, in the process of reviewing it, I will come up with presets. You sure. Know? And even if I don't particularly want the keyboard, I'll just give them to the manufacturer and say, hey, thanks for letting me check this out. Here's your keyboard back and here's some presets I came up with. And Roland took a whole bunch of those presets and, and just, you know, put them online, which is great. Mm -hmm. But that also started a relationship with Roland. You know, they're like, oh, he's the guy who does the good presets. Maybe we should talk to him about, or manuals, you know, like sometimes, um, I'll write a review of something and a company will say, God, he explained this better than we did. I wonder if he writes manuals. Yeah, I write, you know, I've written mm -hmm. a lot of manuals in my time for those reasons. Mm. And then in the process of doing the manuals, you never know what's going to happen. I wrote the manual for the Emulator 2, which Emu put out. And this was just when MIDI was happening. So I was privy to the development of the Emulator 2 because they wanted the manual to come out at the same time, which meant that I could, and they were implementing MIDI in that. So I was able to talk to the people who, would, who, were, who were doing the actual MIDI and they were explaining to me how it worked and what they did and the constraints. And I was able to write MIDI for musicians based on doing the manual for the emulator too because they basically educated me about MIDI ah. beyond just bits and bytes, practical applications and how you'd use this stuff and all that. So then the MIDI for musicians book came out and that led to doing seminars on MIDI and that led to more books, which, you know, it's just the more things you can, can get out of any thing that you do. If you're going to put, if you're going to be playing a gig live, Bring a video recorder, you know, take a video of it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that there's no reason, uh, if, you, if you have a band, video is a great thing to do, but record the sound separately and fly it into a video program like Vegas, which is like designed for musicians. Mm -hmm. So you have your video footage, you sync the audio to it so that the audio is good. And then you can also have two iPhones with background stuff and whenever there's something wrong or a transition yeah. doesn't make it, you have B-roll and, yeah. you know, and so now you've got a video you can put online and it's your calling card and people want to know what you sound like at gigs. You say, well, go to this link, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, but that's what I mean about marketing. Gotcha. That's why marketing, so you got to get your name out there because if you don't, if people don't know you exist, you're not going to be asked to do anything. Mm -hmm. And the noise level is outrageous these days. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, the Craig Anderton, <laughs> thank you so much for sitting well, down thanks, with me. thanks, Ty. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, if you want to see the entire uh, Craig Anderson uh, uncut interview as well as all of the other uncut interviews from this weekend, throw us a buck on Patreon, patreon.com slash Lords of the Trident, and you get access to everything. Uh, and we will be back with more interviews here at Between the Waves Madison, btwmadison.com. Keep watching. We'll see you next time.